Let's open our Bibles together, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 8. I want to read a, a verse that's very, very familiar to us all. The, the whole passage is 28 to 32. But this verse says, we know. We know this, don't we? That all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Or over whom he predestined, these he also called. And who he called, he also justified. And who he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What a precious verse and passage. And, and how important it is for us to lay hold of these things. Because for you and I to be conformed into the likeness of the Lord Jesus is calling for a process to go on in life that at times is absolutely glorious and joy-filled and power-filled. And at other times, it's filled with anguish or confusion or pain, or kind of, God, what the heck is going on, kind of comments. And I think that we've come through quite a season of that together, haven't we? And uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6, reminds us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so faith is a bridge that goes beyond and across and through your circumstances into a, a better place and, and gets you there um, even though you may not be there at the moment. I think we've had answers to life's basic questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? You know, when, when you surrender to Jesus, um, that, that begins to turn on the light, doesn't it? And you, you realize, wow, I'm a creation of God and he has a plan for my life. And, and so I'm here with purpose and I'm going somewhere. And very often new Christians can't wait to get into the book of Revelation and find out Where's this thing going and where does it all end and, and, and where will I be for eternity and all that? And we get those things more or less answered. By the way, it's time to revisit that big time. But sometimes and somewhere between our past and our glorious future, we struggle going through life trying to make sense of it all. And um, why do we have problems and hindrances? And why are things sometimes so convoluted and random? And I have another verse for you. Maybe you want to write this down. John 16, 33. Jesus said this. In the world, friends, you will have trouble. Can you just tell that to the person beside you? Here's a prophetic word for you. In the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, he said. So now we're going through something and coming out the other side. And when Romans 8, uh, 28 says, 
all things work together for good to those who love God. If it's not good yet, that means you're not through it yet. But you will get through it if you pass the test and hang on. Now, this part took me years to figure this out. But I'm now convinced that God is into testing every one of us. And there's a reason for that. Because he wants you to have the the strength and the perseverance and the fortitude and so on that only comes through that kind of testing. And uh, Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. How many know this verse? How many read their Bibles? The whole Bible. Don't just have a smorgasbord, you know, where you pick out your favorites. Read it all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Well, there's biblical basis for testing. You know, in the natural, before we came to Christ, we were used to stuff going wrong and angry half the time and disgusted or dis disappointed a part of the time and because we, we couldn't figure out what, what was going on. And so in a historical perspective, the world has always been full of trouble and wars. You know, one time I looked up in, uh, in the encyclopedia about wars of the British Empire and, and, and Great Britain. And there were thousands of them, something like 20,000 of them. I couldn't believe it. So if they weren't fighting among themselves, they were fighting with their neighbors or somewhere, they were fighting somewhere. And uh, you're like, what, what is it all about? It's just, it's just what life on earth has been with, I guess, with Satan doing what he loves to do, steal, kill, and destroy. But coming to a biblical perspective, I want you to think of the, the saints of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, who, who's your favorite character in the Bible? Who? Joshua. Okay, good. Who else? Gideon, yeah. Esther. Who? Daniel. David. I didn't get it. A centurion. I mean, you can just go on and on, can't you? Most people pick David or Joseph or Jesus or, or one of the apostles or something. Moses even. Now I want you to pick one who had absolutely no problems going through life. Enoch. You know, Enoch lived in a time where God said, I am sorry that I even created man on the face of the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So I think Enoch had his share of problems, even though they're not listed or pointed out for us. What do you think? And, but he walked with God, and you know what happened? God took him. He was, he was raptured. He was caught up. And uh, it's, it's amazing. Like, Enoch was caught up, and Noah and his family went through it uh, in an ark of safety. I think it was a rough ride, but anyway, they came out the other side in a year. But see, when we look at the heroes of the faith, we, we realize that there was this character forming uh, testing that often went along with it. Now here's the problem. Those of us in, I don't know, modern Christendom, let's say, have a notion that if I pray enough, give enough, serve enough, work enough, read enough, study enough, 
give enough, do enough, et cetera, et cetera, enough, I'll have no problems in life because that's how it's supposed to be. The only problem is we don't find biblical examples of that, not even of Jesus. And so that comes upon the body of Christ like a cloud of confusion and they're trying to work out what am I doing wrong? Why is it working for her and not me? Why is he getting ahead and doing so well when it's not working for me? And my conclusion is uh, she and he, they'll have their turn as well. That's just how it works. So I want us to think about the life of Joseph for a minute. How many want Joseph's anointing? See, with, with this little preamble, nobody's going to take the bait now, are they? You know? Come on, how many want Joseph's anointing? Do you? All right, the way you get Joseph's anointing is to go through the process that Joseph went through. So the first thing is you're hated by all your siblings, and they, they wanted to kill you, but they settled for selling you. And so that got rid of him, this dreamer of dreams who thinks that one day he's going to rule over us. Well, many years go by. Joseph was about 17 when that happened. And so about 20 years later, the brothers turn up. They're hungry and they're looking for grain. And Joseph is dressed like an Egyptian, and he's speaking Egyptian. He's unrecognizable to them. He's clean-shaven, for one thing. But he recognizes them. And, uh, you know, Joseph had a heck of a life. Rejected by his brothers. Uh, he ended up in Potiphar's house. It was okay at first. But then he's falsely accused of going after the mistress. And so he ends up in prison. And it wasn't just for a weekend. As near as I can work out, it's probably about 13 years. But somehow or other, he kept his heart right. Uh, why? Because the anointing was still on him and he could still interpret dreams and he did it for this one, did it for that one, did it for the butler, did it for the baker. It all came true. And then one day, Pharaoh has a dream. All right, now somehow there's a sovereign touch on this now. Pharaoh has a dream, and the guy remembers, hey, there was a Hebrew in prison who told me exactly what was going to happen, and it happened. Pharaoh says, go get him. Joseph comes, interprets the dream, and boom, just like that, from prison to prime minister just overnight. Isn't that amazing? And so you can say, well, where did Joseph learn to be prime minister? Where did he learn to be able to, to rule with fairness and with compassion and understanding and wisdom and experience and so on? Tell me. In prison and in slavery and in all that stuff. Let's take another one, King David. How many want David's anointing? Only a few of you. You're really, really nervous now, aren't you? <laughs> How many want David's anointing? <clears throat> How many want King Saul's anointing? <laughs> They're exactly the same, by the way. It's what you do with it that's important. But David's anointed, wow. What a man of God. He kills Goliath, the hero of the nation. He marries the king's daughter. Now he's riding high. Wow, this is amazing to be uh, selected and have an encounter with the Holy Spirit like this. But all of a sudden it turns. And the character forming of David really gets going. And Saul begins hunting him, and it goes so extreme that he eventually leaves and, and uh, goes.
goes over to the Philistines for his own safety. And he's got all his guys with him, 600 sort of outlaws and renegades and whatever that followed him. And uh, it just went from bad to worse to worse. The day came when Israel and Phil Philistines are at war. And so David and his men think, well, we need to go and fight with these guys who have given us safe haven. And they're like, no way, we're not having you. How, how much better way for you to be reconciled to your, to your king than the heads of these men? Send him home. He goes home only to find Ziklag is burned to the ground. The wives are gone, the kids are gone, the stuff is gone. And now his own men are talking about stoning him. This is David's worst day. What do, you, what do you do in your worst day? When everything's gone wrong. I can't even live in my own country anymore. I can't even this, I can't even that. And now here we are with nothing. David inquired of the Lord and said, what do I do? Uh, will, can we pursue them? Will we recover all? And the Lord answered, pursue them and recover all. And that was enough for them to get motivated. And sometimes when we're in that kind of thing, we, we just want to, if we could only get back to the way we were, you know, I've been longing for that through all this whole COVID thing. And probably many of you have too. God, if we could just get this off our backs and get back to the way we were. And so David did that and they, they did recover their stuff. It's like a country and western song, you know. They, they got their wives back and their kids back and their truck back and everything. And, but God had a regime change in mind. And so the battle, the outcome was Saul and sons were killed. And Judah now comes to him and says, David, we want you to come and be king over Judah. And in seven years, he's king over the whole nation. His trials only helped to make him strong. There used to be an old song that was sung by quartets back in the day. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. And so my trials only helped to make me strong. Can you tell that to the person by you there? Your trials only help to make you strong. Wow, what a blessing. I think that's why in the Lord's Prayer, we were encouraged to pray, Lord, lead us not into testing or temptation. Now, God's not gonna tempt you to sin, so don't get that connotation, but it's testing. But deliver us from the evil one. How many would take deliverance? See, God knows that you and I do really well when everything is going our way. But now he wants to know, I wonder how you do when nothing's going your way. You want to see if there's... Christ-like character here. See, because we are being conformed to the likeness of the Lord Jesus, who is tested in every way. Isn't that amazing? He wasn't exempt being the Son of God. He didn't, he didn't say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that part. He embraced the whole thing. There's a popular theology going through the body of Christ which says, if you have enough faith, if you really know the word and if you're really full of prayer and full of worship, I mean, you really worship and you're really full of the spirit. And if you give and serve and help out and on and on and put that all together, you won't have any problems in life. And, you know, maybe it's worth a comment in there. You can avoid a lot of problems 
by avoiding sin. And, you know, when, when we do stupid things, it invites problems and disaster. But I'm talking about people who are walking the walk, you know, and still trying to do it all right. And yet, these disasters come along. I mean, Carol and I are not exempt from these things. I mean, she's, she's had health issues for like 15 years. And uh, we've just pursued healing and pursued healing. And everywhere we go, we see all kinds of people healed of all kinds of things, including our issues. And uh, you think, Lord, you just healed that person's knees. It'd be nice if you healed Carol's knees and uh, or whatever it is. <clears throat> And so you pursue looking after yourself and all that is a part of it. We've learned a lot about being sensible. But, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to have the Holy Spirit just come on you and <laughs> heal everything all in one shot? How many would like that? But my precious wife she soldiers on anyway and uh, yeah we get breakthroughs along the way she she found out of all things that that she had Lyme's disease boy that answered a lot of questions you guys have that here and uh, then the next thing was oh, oh I hear that's pretty much incurable if you've had it for any length of time but no it's not there's frequencies and things that will cure it and she doesn't have it anymore, and she doesn't have the, all that years of diarrhea anymore. And, and we're really getting somewhere. So we're down to the knees at the moment. And, uh, yeah. But see, all these things keep you leaning into him. Lord, I can't even do life without you. So when we think of our favorite Bible characters... Yeah, I like Enoch too. We we don't uh, we we don't know that much about him, but um, I like that he was raptured. Are you you guys still hanging on to that? It's coming soon, by the way. I really do believe it. And uh, let's take another one, because see, when we get a prophetic word we assume that everything's going to go well. How many have had a prophetic word recently? I mean, have you had Isabel through here, John and others, and, and or different prophetic people, and they give you this glowing word, and it's so encouraging. You think, finally, there's my breakthrough. You know, this is, we're, we're on the upward path now. Here we go. Well, let's look at Paul. <clears throat> Paul trying to go here, trying to go there. The door won't open. The Holy Spirit saying no. Finally has a dream. A man in Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. So that's not even a prophetic word through another person. This is God giving him a dream. He's like, that's it, Silas. Macedonia, here we come. The next day, they got on a boat. They sailed for Philippi. And this is, you can read it in Acts 16.23. Then it goes all, it goes great for a while. You know, they met Lydia and she invited them into her house and there's a prayer meeting down by the river and, and, and there's a gathering starting and they're, they're starting to be effective and they're sharing their ministry. But there's an, this annoying little slave girl that's following them along going, these men are the servants of the Most High God. And, and Paul put up with it for two or three days and finally he turned and rebuked that fortune-telling spirit as it come out of her in the name of Jesus. And she was set free. But her slave owners realized that now she can't make money telling fortunes. And so they had him arrested and they're beaten with rods and thrown into the inner dungeon in a prison in Philippi, which is probably not 
uh, pretty place. How many have ever been in a prison in a third world country? Yeah, it's not where you'd want to spend even one night, is it? I remember the first time we went to one in, uh, <clears throat> in Juarez, Mexico. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't believe it. In, in our, our days, you know, that there's places like that. Anyway, that's where they were. They're in there with their backs bleeding, bruised, and their feet in the stocks. That means they're locked down in stocks. What are they saying to each other? Or what would you be saying? God, I don't understand. I've given my life to you. We came here. We left everything to follow you. This is, where are you when we need you? We can't even move. And I have to go to the bathroom. What would you be saying? God, you gave me this dream. Silas leans over to Paul. Yeah, you and your dreams. That's what got us in this mess. No. One of them said, you know what? We need to sing. We need to worship the Lord. Yeah, but it's midnight and the others are trying to sleep. I don't care. We're just going to start worshiping the Lord. And it says that the other prisoners heard them. And while they're worshiping and praising, this supernatural earthquake hits. And all the prisoners are set free and all the doors swing open. It woke the jailer up. And he's like, what's going on? Oh, God, the doors are all open. Where's my sword? I want to kill myself. Paul hollers out, do yourself no harm. We're all here. That was the next miracle. All the doors open, all the chains off. No prisoners ran for it. That's amazing. Everybody's too freaked out over the, the supernatural. These guys are singing to God praises, and this happened. And so the next thing you know, they take them into their home and wash their wounds and feed them and look after them and completely turned around. In the morning, he says, hey, good news. The magistrates have said you can leave. And Paul says, oh, they have, have they? But you tell them for me that they beat Roman citizens without a proper trial and everything else. And so he better come here. They better come themselves and ask me nicely to leave. Which they did in great concern, you know. And then he took his time. He went by Lydia's place and said goodbye to her and then eventually moved on. That's kind of how life goes, isn't it? If you choose to praise the Lord anyhow, in the worst of circumstances, he has promised to see you through because you see all things work together for good to those who love God. The worst thing in my life was the death of my first marriage. I was just so devastated. I thought, well, there goes my hope of ever being in the ministry. And I begged God to fix it. And the more I begged, the worse it got. And finally, it was over. Got divorce in the mail. So that's it. Well, I guess I'll go into business. Carol and I got married in 1979. 1980, we made a mission trip to Indonesia, figuring maybe we could raise money or something and help out. But no, uh, we got so undone by the love of those people that he called us into ministry and said, uh, oh, so you'll do anything? You'll go anywhere? Good, I want you to go back to Carol's hometown and start a church. And that was the worst place I, I wanted to go. But we said anywhere. You got to be careful what the, the Lord hears you saying, you know. But see, the, everything pivoted for me at that point. 1979, 
15 years later, we would be in the throes of a revival that was beyond anything I had ever imagined or dreamt. But see, through all the testing and the pressures and the going on in life, God is hoping that you're going to respond with forgiveness and with kindness and with faith toward him. But here's the dynamic. Life and life's experiences will either make you bitter or better. Your choice. King Saul chose the wrong way. He got bitter, didn't he? The people's fault, it's not my fault, it's this and that and the other. David, who sinned a whole lot more than Saul did, as far as I can tell, uh, had a way of forever running to the Lord in humility and just crying out to God and asking for forgiveness and for divine help. That's the key. Never give up. Never get tired of running back to the Lord and saying, I need your help. You know, we've learned something from different Christians a number of years ago. Gosh, it's got to be 15 or 18 years ago when <clears throat> we first did ministry to the persecuted church. And the first one was unforgettable. We went to Turkey and hosted a, a leader school for Christian leaders from Iran. And we brought them in and they came from all over Europe, but we raised money and brought about 40 of them in from Iran itself. And you know, they had it all worked out. Some flew to Amsterdam, others to here, to there, but we all met up in Turkey. And oh my goodness, we had about 120 Iranians. And when it came to talking about forgiveness, I felt like, God, how can I talk to, about forgiveness to these people who have been brutalized, who have been so abused and this and that and the other. Like there was one young woman there, I'd say about 26 or in there, and she was, had this big facial cut on her cheek, but her arms and legs and back, I mean, we didn't see them all, but on her arms, they were cut uh, with, with a knife regularly. And the guards would cut her and squeeze lemon juice into it. And then they'd tell her, all this can stop. You can go home tomorrow. Just renounce Jesus and return to Islam. And she would say, I could never renounce Jesus because through him I found true love. I found the love of God. So you're going to have to just do what you do, but I'll never renounce him. Now, somehow or other, she got out after a while. Here she is in our school. And I'm up there talking about uh, the importance of forgiveness and how if you forgive, um, God, of course, forgives you, but it sets you free now to learn from life and become more like Jesus, etc. So when I gave the invitation that day, there was at least three minutes of dead silence. And then, first of all, one, one young lady came up, broke weeping at the front, then another, then another, then another. Pretty soon the whole room is up wailing at the front. And they cried like I've never seen people cry as they chose to forgive their torturers because they wanted to be free. And then the worship team ran, grabbed their instruments, and they started celebrating. Oh, my goodness. They praised God and danced and shouted and everything for the longest while. And I'd never seen anything like it. 
And I realized that these people, these persecuted Christians, they're carrying something that I know very, very little about. Then about a month later, we went to India and did uh, meetings with a, almost a thousand young leaders of Jossi Chaco's network, who I think he lives in Melbourne still. And there was one girl there that, you know, all the messages and everything, nothing seemed to touch her. She'd just taken it all in intellectually. And uh, we'd covered the father's heart, and we'd covered this and covered that, and she's still very stoic. <clears throat> and uh, I said to the translator, I want to talk to that young woman there, find out what's going on with her. And tell me your story. She says, well, when, when I was three years old, my father sold me to a wealthy pedophile to be a wife to him. And then when I was 12 years old, he kicked me out, said, go, this is no longer your home, out on the street. And at 12 years old, fortunately, some Christians found her and took her in. Now here she is, about 25, 26, and she's a pastor now, but her emotions and her heart is so shut down. Whew. Well, the time came to pray for everybody. We had them all lined up, a thousand of them out there in a, in a big tennis court. I came to this woman. I, I said, God, if you ever use me to bless another person, could it please be this girl? And I spent, I don't know, felt like five or ten minutes. I'm sure it was only one or two. But God, come on her. Come on her and help her. And finally she fell down in the dirt, you know. So I thought, well, great. At least she's down. So I carried on. And I came back. She's still down. And I'm just standing over her, praying and saying, Holy Spirit, just get her, just get her somehow. And all of a sudden she exploded in laughter. Just exploded, like belly laughing, like I'd never really seen, seen anybody do. And I'm thinking, I bet you that's the first time in her life she's ever laughed like that. And that went on and on and on. And so I saw her a half an hour later, I guess. I said, can I do something with you that is totally against your culture, but I just feel it would be from the Lord. She said, what is that? I said, I'd love to give you a father's hug. And she said, yes. And I wrapped my arms around her, you know, and held her. And I said everything I could think of, like I would to one of my own daughters. You are a treasure. You're a princess. You're so amazing, so beautiful. God's hand is all over you. You have a destiny, and, and I love you, and God loves you. And I just poured it all out. And she just stood there quietly weeping, you know. And um, that was it. She came back to me a few minutes later and said, Pastor, when you hugged me, something very, very dark lifted off of me. And I thought, oh, God, thank you. You met that young woman, and she had a download and an understanding of the love of God. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, but God is faithful. You know, he won't allow all this to just be wasted. Tell the person next to you, your, your trials are character building if you let it turn that way. Matthew 25, 21. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. 
enter into the joy of your Lord. Luke 19 and verse 17 says, hey, you were faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over 10 cities, over five cities. I want you to know that the promise of the millennial kingdom is an absolute certain reality. And we are in the time frame right now where this is about to wind up. Are you guys aware of that? Does this church preach the soon coming of the Lord Jesus? Congratulations, because most don't. It's all about the here and the now. Yeah, we need to be equipped so that we can get through life. But you know, life is very short. I remember my dad saying to me, life is short, son. I was about 17 at the time. And I'm thinking, yeah, maybe for you. Well, I got my whole life ahead of me, dad. Right? When you're 17, you think. Now that I'm almost 82, you think life is not very long at all. Yeah, I've made 81 trips around the sun. And what's it, what is, what's it all about? What's going on? It's about life, ministry, whatever, me being conformed into the likeness of Jesus and helping as many people get on board with that as I can and not to let the trials of life um, discourage you to the point of quitting. I mean, I could ask you, what kind of soil are you? How many want to be good soil? How many want to be rocky and hard? Or on the path, you know, and whatever. I mean, there's, there's only one type of soil that produced fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold. <sighs> you know, I... I I have a little grid that I like to hold up for myself and anyone else that we're thinking of hiring or whatever else. <clears throat> and the first one is character. Be a man and a woman of character, godly character. That means you keep your promises. That means you pay your debts. That means you try to be on time. That means a lot of things like that, yeah? The next thing is competent. Be good at what you do. And in, in terms of ministry, it means be anointed, be effective, be fruitful, yeah? And uh, the third thing is your motive. What's your motive? Why do you want to be in ministry? Well, I figured it'd be easier than some of the other choices I could have made, no. <laughs> I mean, if you only work one or two hours a week, what could be better than that, right? Uh, motive, so important. All right, you want to heal the sick. Why do you want to heal the sick? So you can be the great one or so you can help people? Jesus did it because he was really wanting to help people. And he wanted to show them what the Father's really like that he's kind and he's loving and he's compassionate. And the fourth thing is your history. What's your track record? What fruit is there in your life? Wait a minute, you've been to five churches in five years? Why can't you settle in and be a part of one? If you're looking for the perfect church, good luck with that. But if you find it, don't join because you'll ruin it. <laughs> Right? These are just things that help us find our way. Remember, your trials only help to make you strong. So I want to ask you today, we as Christians can, we get good at putting on a plastic smile and walking into service and worshiping away, you know, we smile around, it's all good. But inside, we're like, God, I don't get it. Why, why am I going through these 
hard times. And, and many times it's serious stuff, like divorce, like illness. Where were you? My God, you promised to heal. My mother died of cancer. And, you know, the trials of life knock a lot of people out. And I don't say you miss heaven necessarily, but you might disqualify yourself for leadership in tomorrow's world. Friends, we are so close to the return of the Lord Jesus. And I'm convinced before that happens, we, are ent we will enter into the greatest harvest the world has ever seen. And we just need a few godly people who won't be put off by the randomness of life and say, I'm, I'm going through no matter what it takes. You know, we were just on a leader's retreat and a young pastor there named Geraldine was with us. Geraldine is from uh, France, from Lyon, France. And when, when I was there with her one time, I said, Geraldine, I want you to take me to the old Roman theater where, where they used to, the saints would be thrown to the lions and all of that stuff. And there, there was one precious young woman who was a slave girl, and I think she was 18 years old. And the Romans uh, decided to make an example out of her. And they tortured her, they whipped her, they beat her, they did everything they could to make her renounce Jesus, and she would not. And finally, they put her in a cage and barbecued her over a fire. And she died singing praises to Jesus. And because of her life, thousands said, I want to serve that God. If he meant that much to her, then I want to serve him. These are our these are all our saints that have gone on before us who weren't expecting a, a walk through the garden, you know, a cakewalk, a rose garden type of thing. They were prepared to say whatever it takes. You know, in Iran today is one of the greatest revivals in the world going on. You're probably aware of it. There's a lot been written now. And they don't have the expectation that if I do it all right, it's gonna be easy going. No, they're like, if this cost me my life, so be it, but I have got to share Jesus. You know, we cower when it comes time to share him sometimes. We're so absorbed with, with our own family and our own needs and our own life and our own wants and whatever. But I wanna to speak to those of you who might be discouraged at the moment. You know, we've come through a COVID season. We've come through all kinds of job loss. I mean, some of the things people have had family members die and you couldn't even be with them in the hospital and uh, all that kind of stuff. And then the funeral and you could only have 10 there type of stuff. It was the same in Canada, horrible. And, uh, How are you doing with it all? If you have gone through a time of discouragement, kind of, God, I thought you loved me, where are you? That's okay. But I just, I just want you to just honestly say, yeah, John, that's, that's me actually. I've been struggling, because it, it seems to be working for the others, but not really working for me. If that's you, unashamedly hold up your hand right here. Unashamedly. And if it's not you, if you're on top of the world, don't feel left out. He'll get around to you, I promise. Let's stand.
Lord Jesus, I'm so glad for your exceeding great and precious promises that all things work together for good to those that love you. And I just want you to come forward and acknowledge it right now and we'll pray together over this. Just those of you who raised your hands, come on. Those of you who didn't but wanted to, you come too. We're gonna be like King David. In the face of problems, yeah, just spread out, come on. In the face of problems and trials, there's only one place where we can go, and that's to the Lord, right? And sometimes we're presented, and I guess rightly so, with a kind of a rah, rah, rah Christianity. You know, Ozzy, 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 oi, 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 come on, let's do it. And yet that's not always, keep coming, friends. Come a little closer, come on. Yeah, come on. I want all of you to know that he sees and he hears and he understands. And your trials will cause you to go one of two ways, bitter or better. And I want you to choose better. So what that means is we need to forgive the people who hurt you and caused the problem. Or if it was you, you need to forgive yourself or if you blame God, you need to stop that because God has never sinned and he wants only the best for you. But life is hard. Remember, we are growing up the wheat and the tares together. Wheat in the weeds. Any farmer will tell you, you don't want weeds growing in your wheat field because they sap the moisture and really diminish the crop, yeah? The rest of you stretch your hand toward these who have come. I want you to know, friends, that church is a safe place for you. Okay? You don't have to have it all together. But remember what David did. On his worst day, he went and encouraged himself in the Lord. Imagine what that prayer was like. God, I've lost everything. I don't know what to do. Lord, will you speak to me right now? Pour your heart out to him. You know, he wants us to worship him in the spirit and in truth. And uh, part of that truth is being honest with God and telling him how you really feel. You don't have to yell and berate him or anything, but just pour your heart out to him. Say, God, I want to get through life intact. I want to go to heaven when I die. And I want to take a whole load of people with me. And I, I can't do it all weighed down and broken down with hurt and pain and self-pity and all that stuff. So I'm going to trust you that what I'm going through right now is going to be defeated one way or another and it'll only make me a better person and a better Christian. Lord, I bless all these who have come. In Jesus' name.